This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. City University Television presents The American Theatre Wing Seminars Working in the Theatre This seminar, Performance Welcome to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre. These are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, which is located right in the heart of Times Square, right where Broadway, Off-Broadway, and Off-Off-Broadway all go out to show the very best that New York has to open. And when they come open in New York and then they go out from the outside comes the very best at the regional theater, and the theaters outside come to New York and help them as well. Today's seminar is on the performance, and these seminars are geared to show you what it is to work in the theater, what it is to work from the, in the theater from the standpoint of the performer, of the playwright, of the director, of the agent, and unions and guilds as well. The American Theatre Wing is a year-round organization, and although we are known for our Tony Awards and justly proud of them, it, they were not given and are not given just for the rave review or the longest run. They were created in the honor of a woman named Antoinette Perry, who believed very strongly in training for the theater. And so this award is given for those who have achieved a degree of excellence in the craft of theater. Miss Perry also believed in giving back everything that the theater gave to you, the magic of theater to be brought back to those who were studying in the theater. And so our programs also stress that. We give back through the theater the magic of theater through our many, many year-round programs. We have a program that goes out to hospitals, nursing homes, and aid centers to bring the magic of theater to those that, who can't come to it. We have a program called Introduction to Broadway, and that's with the Board of Education and the Board of Education of junior high schools as well. And we bring students into the Broadway theaters the unique part of this program is that each student pays a very small sum for their ticket. But that's important because they learn the art and the habit of buying and committing themselves to going to the theater. It's a very important part of theater going and it not only enhances their education but it, it also, I hope, creates the audience of the future. We also have a Saturday Theater for Children, and that goes, schools, that goes into the schools at the very youngest age, and to introduce them to live theater as well. And then these seminars, they're a wonderful introduction to the theater, and they are also geared towards giving back as well. The people on the performance seminar and every one of our seminars give to not only each other the craft of theater as they discuss what it is to work in the theater to the students as well. I'm Isabel Stevenson and I'm going to turn this over right now to our co-moderators Brendan Gill who is a member of the board of directors of the American Theater Wing. He's a, an author and a critic and a longtime member of the New Yorker magazine and Jean Dalrymple, who is also a member of the Board of Directors of the American Theatre Wing and is a long-time example of what the theatre should be. I think Jean has done everything in the theatre from writing to working to press agent to managing. 
And between the two of them, I think they will bring to you really important gems that will come out of what it is to work in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan? Thank you. All of us made such pitiful attempts to do well in our voice test that we have partly identified ourselves already. But let me do my share of the identifying. On the far right, Victor Garber, who is playing uh, the devil in uh, Damn Yankees. Gene Kerr said long ago, the devil gets the best lines and always does. Uh, Victor has many of the best lines, which he deals with joyously. Uh, next, uh, Murray uh, Abraham, who is now playing one of the most odious roles ever written, that of Roy Cohn, uh, in Angels in America, and who also has the distinction of being a professor of theater at Brooklyn College. He may be addressed in that way as uh, your magnificence. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> based in Susan Egan, who is making her Broadway uh, debut as Belle in Beauty and the Beast, who is a graduate of UCLA and has had much experience on the West Coast, of which I believe she is a native. Jean, take over. Thank you very much. I enjoy taking over always. I love to speak after I've done the one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> <laughs> Um, way down there, we, <laughs> we have a lovely girl named Baby Newworth. She's currently playing the good part of Lola in Broadway's Damn Yankees. Known widely, how, however, as Dr. Lilith Sternen Crane on Cheers. I suppose that's, uh, what do you call it? TV. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> also way down there is, uh, oh, that re reminds me, I was supposed to mention these names first and then describe them. I apologize to the men up there because they need my, my names to put the camera on them. So this time I will mention the name first, Burke Moses. He's currently appearing as Gaston in Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> um, then we have um, uh, Michael Learned, currently Sarah Good in the Sisters Rosenzweig. That's me. And I, and I should have said your name first. <laughs> this time you did. So that they'd be sure to put the camera on you. They will put the camera on you, however. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have someone I saw last night in a very amusing role. And uh, laughter on the third, 23rd floor. God, what a funny show. How can you all stand it, especially you? <laughs> <laughs> His name is Nathan Lane. That's for the people over there with the... <laughs> he's now, well, I've told you that, he's now in laughter on the 23rd floor. And boy, is he good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gene has already stolen the show. So, uh, everybody else, just do your best. I mean, it's pitiful. But <laughs> when, you, when, we were, when we were talking uh, in, in the green room, which is not green, but, but it's sort of a nasty old shade of gray, um, uh, it turned out everybody was interested in, in, in everybody in the teaching of acting and, and uh, for example Victor is, is going to be teaching a course uh, I guess this summer but uh, and of course we have the his magnificence the professor here uh, right next to Victor but tell me what your teaching role is Wh whom are you teaching and what are you teaching well I started out teaching at uh, HB studios uh, because um, Uta Hagen had asked me to come down there and we'd work together in a play and I was very nervous Boy. I didn't know anything about acting even though I'd been doing it for a long time. And what I realized was that because I had been doing it for so long, I did know something about it. And I was able to at least communicate what it was like to work in the theater <clears throat> as a working actor as opposed to just someone who taught. And um, 
From there, I went to the, um, I was asked to teach at the Manhattan School of Music, which is a, to professional musical theater uh, prof professionals, and um, basically teaching acting to, to singers and dancers. And because uh, in my opinion, there's no difference, you, you know. Um, so I, I'm just actually teaching acting to these uh, for three weeks in the summer. And uh, this is my third year doing it. And, and uh, it's, it's a, it's a, what, what it does for me is it kind of solidifies to myself what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot yeah. out of doing it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I kind of learn, uh, I kind of get back to basics again. And I also, um, <coughs> you know, once again, talk about my experiences as an actor. Uh, and and I've, I've been around so long now. But uh, <laughs> it just feels like, you know, I, can, I have something to, to, to impart, even though uh, most of the time I, I don't really, I don't think you can teach acting. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you can sort of help someone to reveal themselves. But mm -hmm. that's about it. So Who, who taught you? <laughs> I just copied everybody I ever saw. <laughs> I did. I just watched every actor I ever uh, was that ever impressed me. I just thought, well, what are they doing, and how do they do that? And then I just, you know, that's my my technique. I mean, technique is 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 an individual thing, and uh, and I just sort of, um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, when I say I copied, I mean that, you know, I I I I I, I saw what it was that impressed me about certain actors, and I tried to uh, understand what that was in myself. And that's how I learned how to Did you go to school? Where did you go to school? I did not go to school. Okay. Ever, perhaps. Actually, <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I'm speaking about how long he's been in, in, in acting. Well, no, I, I left the Civil War. That's, that's right. <laughs> I was up for that. Yeah. So I, uh, I was. Uh, <laughs> I left school when I was 16, and I went and I became a professional, uh, actually a singer. And I never went back to school, and so mm -hmm. I basically, you know, that's how I learned to act by acting and by watching other actors. Mm -hmm. that's now, Marty, uh, having heard uh, from your colleague yes. uh, that he doesn't believe it can be taught, and you're the teacher, how, how do you there, feel about that? There are several things he said. Uh, that they really, they're all true. He said, "Wonderful man." He's Thank really, you, it's all this, it is true. The thing that uh, that you can impart, that you can share, is uh, through simply your being with people who want to act. There's a, there's a kind of an osmosis thing that takes place. Because uh, as a working actor who is teaching, as was true of so many artists in, in previous times, musicians and dancers, and they make the best teachers. Uh, what it does if you're a working actor who is teaching is remind you of how little you know. Because if you only teach, th that's fine too, but if you only teach, you don't really know for sure if what you're teaching works. As I, I have students here from my graduate class at Brooklyn College, uh, as I explain to them, what I tell you in, in theoretical terms doesn't really always apply. It's what you should be doing. The fact is, when I opened my show, I had a little over two weeks rehearsal to open two shows, right? It's not that a big show. deal. It was, it was, it's Angels, Angels in America. In Thank you. Okay. Angels in America. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that I, I was prepared and I really worked hard and then after about two, a little over two weeks, I, I was ready to have an audience see me. They would prove to me what I, what I needed to know. So when it came time to get up on the stage, I had two shows to, to open in two days and all I could think was, I wish I was somewhere else. <laughs> I, this is crazy, but I have to do it, and now I'm committed, and maybe there'll be a, you know, some terrible earthquake, and I won't have to do it. In other words, it's all the stuff that everybody goes through, whether you've been in the business for as long as Victor, or me, <laughs> <laughs> which is a long time, or if you're just starting out, it always comes back to the same basic, terrible fear just before you go on, most of the time. Um, but. Uh, this actually happened to me. Uh, I play Roy Cohn, and he's really this very uh, high-powered, uh, very verbal, extremely intelligent man. And he, he talks very quickly, otherwise it doesn't work. If you start a stream of these words going, and if you stumble, it ain't Roy Cohn. It just ain't. So what happens is you learn it very well, and then you just turn it on and hope it all comes out. Uh, and all I could think of is in, in the middle of this terrific speech in the, in the last act of... Uh, Millennium approaches was this. I swear, in the middle of this tremendous speech, was, "Am I wearing my shoes?" <laughs> <laughs> I swear this is true. I thought I didn't put them on because I had a lot of changes at the end, and I could think, "Do I have my shoes on?" 
<laughs> and I'm, I'm acting all the time. I'm saying the words, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making the gestures, but I'm thinking, I've got to have my shoes on. <laughs> and, and, and I started to wiggle my toes to see if I had my shoes on. And I started thinking of a way to put the blocking together so I could look at my feet to see if I had my shoes on. And then I, and then I was thinking, if I do see that I don't have my shoes on, I'm really going to lose my line. This is all while you're acting, you know, <laughs> while you're being Roy Cohn, you know. <laughs> And so <laughs> all this stuff is just theory until you get up on your feet and you do it. Like Victor says, it's true. You can talk all you want to about it, but there's only one place finally to learn. That's up there with your hair on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you may, anybody may notice I that my the, shoes. The, one of the shoes he's brought, he's brought today. And then Susan has on some remarkable shoes which are tied together with ship's rigging. Yes. Um, I don't know what ship she came through the Panama Canal in, but it's nice that you have a souvenir. In well, that. thank yeah. you. Now, Bibi, you've also been, you have also taught out in Orange County. Yes, oh. very briefly. I was asked um, by a friend in of mine. In California, that is. That's Orange right. Um, a friend of mine was at, uh, was with American Ballet Theater and came up to me in ballet class one day out in Los Angeles and asked me if I would teach a course to her students at the Orange County High School of Performing Arts to the, to the ballet dancers, teach them how to act. I immediately said no because I don't know how to act and I <laughs> certainly wouldn't want to do that to a <laughs> impressionable <laughs> preteen. And um, <laughs> but then, you know, she w we talked about it for a while and, and decided what I would teach was uh, dance performance, um, acting for dancers, dance performance. What I boiled it down to is what happens uh, when you take dance outside of the classroom. There's, there's something that happens when you dance in the classroom and you're just working on your technique in ballet class. And then there's something that happens when you dance on a stage and it's different. And um, that's what I, I only taught just for uh, one semester. And um, it was really interesting to explore that in exercises and with these, with these girls with, who had very, very limited performance experience. And you were saying that you learned by teaching. Yes, I, I, I uh, <clears throat> it, it, it sort of, as, as Victor and we were saying, it sort of, it, it, it makes, it forces you to define things that you just do naturally in the course of your professional life. You, you know, I perform as a dancer, I'm a, I, I'm a professional dancer. That's what I do. Now, I, I never really thought about what exactly it was. And now in trying to teach other people, I, I have to think, uh, I have to define what it is so that I can tell that mm -hmm. to these girls. And did you have a young or old teacher who, who was teaching you? I actually um, went to the High School of the Arts that oh, Baby taught. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes. um, but before, actually, you, you taught. Susan's I, my daughter, by the yeah, way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. Um, I uh, studied at the High School of the Arts, um, and I went to UCLA, and initially I was a theater major for my first semester. And I found that, for me, studying history and anthropology and uh, other things uh, were more important and actually helped my acting more than studying in a classroom. Um, everybody, I think, learns differently. And for me, taking class for acting didn't work so well. Um, I am learning as I go. I kind of think of um, what I'm doing now as my apprenticeship, and I think I learn better by doing mm -hmm. and by getting up there and uh, watching people who I work with. and trying to take everything in and by working with a lot of different people, uh, witnessing everybody's different techniques and finding what works for them and then trying it out myself. And so I'm sort of establishing my own technique now. Um, but And that was an ancient tradition, surely, that actors went on stage. The Booth family, three generations of Booth, mm -hmm. they all, and they were all thrust on stage for boy parts, whatever it was, at eight or nine mm -hmm. or ten. Mm -hmm. Buster Keaton was on stage at two. <laughs> his parents threw him, wasn't yeah, it? They, one, 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 one time in the Haven, they were playing in the Haven, and some Hector, a Yale undergraduate, was out in the audience making fun of his mother. And the father, Mr. Keaton Sr., picked up little Buster and, and hurled him into the audience and broke the Yale undergraduate's front tooth. Uh, one of them, a dangerous baby. He was a projectile. As well as a baby. Uh, Nathan, you've taught, or have you not taught? Uh, no, I've never taught. Um, 
Uh, I've just tried to emulate Victor Garber. I'm sort of obsessed with Canadian actors <laughs> and, um, and to find the right shoes, you know. And I think if it's Eugene O'Neill, it's boots. And of course, if it's Terence McNally, it's pumps. <laughs> And really, I've guided my whole career based on shoes. <laughs> and Victor Garber. And if I, if I could ever wear Victor Garber's shoes. What about barefoot? Uh, well, that yeah. Come. Barefoot, that eventually, I hope. Um, no, I've never taught. Um, I, uh, how did, I guess we're talking about how we, uh, how we got started. And, and um, um, I, was, uh, I, I was supposed to go to college. I went for about an, an hour and a half. I went <laughs> the day of registration and then, and through a series of circumstances, decided not to go at the last minute and left and, and sort of went into uh, acting. And, um, and I didn't really study. I, I, I've, I've sort of uh, have to reiterate what Murray and Victor were saying, that um, I think it, it is something you learn on the job. And, and the only way to really learn how to act is to, is to do it on a stage in front of a group of people. And, um, I have taken some classes. I took a, um, at some point, somebody said to me, well, you know, you should study, you should do some, you know, so uh, get some sort of foundation. And, and, and I took a kind of a crash summer course at uh, the Stella Adler studio. I, I didn't study with Stella Adler. That was real smart. I, uh, <laughs> I was working with her cousin or something. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she uh, and it was a, I was I was very young and and uh, and it was a little too abstract for me and she would say you know there were classes she would say go to the window and tell me what you see you know describe and people would go as oh I see a homeless person I see the you know the poverty in the world and I see I see dark clouds and I see you know the tragedy of life and she said what do you see and I said I see four hundred dollars going down the drain. <laughs> Well, I think you ought to get back to work in the theater. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> however, it is, uh, it, anything is valuable anytime you can get up in front of a group of people and work uh, anywhere in a, in a class and, and hopefully eventually in a, in a professional situation. Um, and then I did actually study with a woman. Her name is Joan Bellamo. She uh, had an acting class, and I studied for about two years with her. And she had, um, I think she had taught at the Neighborhood Playhouse. And, um, and uh, as, uh, essentially, what happened was I, uh, I was a struggling New York actor. And, and um, for me, what really helped me was uh, I, I got into stand-up comedy. Somebody, I had been acting in New York for a while. and. And I wasn't able to make a living, and um, and someone said, "Well, you should try. You're you're funny. Why don't you you know try doing that?" And and it was a very freeing experience for me because uh, eventually I I put an act together with with another actor who was also out of work, and <laughs> and um, and I became you know a writer. Suddenly I became I had to write my own material and my own producer and my own director, and and I learned a great deal. It's, it's certainly, you learn very quickly what works or doesn't work in front of an audience, uh, especially in a, in a nightclub or opening for a rock act. You find out very fast if you're funny or not. And um, so, and that sort of led me to uh, going to L.A. for a while, and then eventually I, I got back to New York and, and the theater, which is what I really started out to do. But um, it was a very freeing experience as an actor because you're so dependent on being, ca being cast in a play on someone else hiring you. And uh, suddenly having my own product and being my own sort of producer and director and writer was, uh, was a very liberating thing for me and, uh, and changed my sort of feelings about the business. And I wasn't sort of, uh, I could sort of control it to a certain degree because I always had this product I could take out and, and do and do anywhere and also I hopefully honed some some skills in the process so well said what about you did you go to school to acting or did you pick it up I went to school in England actually to a vocational school in England so 
It was very structured. It was a ballet, primarily a ballet school, but we had dance classes every day, different different kinds. And um, I was a special drama student because I was a terrible dancer. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they said, we think maybe you ought to try drama here. So, <coughs> but it was fabulous because I was 11 years old and we were studying Shakespeare voice production and tocostal diaphragmatic breathing, uh, mime scenes, uh, at 11, so that your whole physical body was actually being formed uh, to the point where by the time you're ready to work, you, you're forgetting about all the technique. It's just there. It's part of you. It's really wonderful. So I'm very grateful to have had that. But I, I think I learned an awful lot when I went from theater into television, which was interesting t for me, too, because um, I had been in regional theater for a long time, and that was fabulous. Um, but television is such a, excuse me, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's a lot of things. But what I learned from it was to be simple and the, the old talk and listen stuff, mm -hmm. um, which was very helpful to me. I mean, the technique is wonderful to f have to fall back on when nothing else is working for you on stage. But to actually just be present and to take the risks of being different every night was something I really learned yes. in the immediacy of doing film and television. And that helped me on stage. What, what, sh <coughs> what you just said about having something to fall back on is very interesting. With as many years' experience as we have, it still is necessary. Yeah. There are places where you just you say, I'm lost. Yeah. <laughs> and then you fake That's it as you, best you, you can. Fake it. You fake it. <laughs> <laughs> And you hope you can figure it well People don't believe that, you know, people. when you say it. They won't believe it. Yeah. But it's what, true. What does that come back? What is that? What do you <coughs> fall back on? Your experience or, or what you have been taught? Well, I tried something once. I had to do it, you know, I had to do a, a television show that was horrible. I just hated it. Not the show, but I mean, the, this was a movie of the week, so I just don't want you to think I'm talking about <laughs> another show that we all love. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I had to do it because I needed to, I don't know, feed my kids or something, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was awful, and, and there was a scene that was sort of a rip-off of, of that m movie that with Glenn Close where she cried in the shower, and, and I had to cry in the shower, <laughs> and I've always had a hard time crying on stage. I cry in real life at the drop of a hat, but on stage <laughs> I have a hard time. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'm just going to, I'm just not going to dredge up all that stuff for this scene. It's crap and I'm so what I'm going to do is just fake it and see if I can and, and because I was in the shower I knew I'd have water on my face so, <laughs> <laughs> so it was totally fake phony I faked the whole thing and it was wonderful <laughs> <laughs> I mean I, I right. wasn't wonderful but the scene worked is what yeah. I'm trying to say and <coughs> it was absolutely it was acting is what it was and for what it's worth, there it is. <laughs> but no. be sure you have shower. A bath is good. Now, unlike uh, the Moses of history, you've, you've been allowed to enter the promised land. Uh, here you are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, we're, we're in a hit Broadway show. We couldn't be happier. Mm -hmm. And where had you begun? Uh, I, I actually did go to a school. I went to Carnegie Mellon University, and I was sort of, uh, had, had three three turbulent years there where I was sort of in school and out of school. I'd stop to work and, and I'd go back and uh, school for me was sort of a, a mixed blessing. Uh, I, uh, there were some teachers, it was, it was like a smorgasbord. You're, you're picking up a little here, a little there, whatever you can use. Um, you know, they're talking about technique and some teachers would teach you to have a technique when you're picking up a glass to put it over this and then you're going to flick your ashtray, your ash in the ashtray and you're going to do this because of this. And, and eventually you get so bogged down in, 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 in trying to incorporate this teacher's technique that uh, you just lose all sense of the scene. And so you do. You just learn to, to let go. And, and when, whether you're doing a serious drama or whether you're doing a very broad musical like we're doing, uh, all of a sudden you realize the scene doesn't work. And that is when you go back and deal with the questions. Okay, who are you? What are you doing? What are you trying? What is your action here? What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, Why did I a script? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, it, it's when you, get in, when you get in trouble, you go back to that. But uh, like everyone else here, uh, most of what I learned was, was from the stage and, and uh, watching people who were, who were better than me at the time and then sitting in the backstage and 
kind of, you know, mm. Nathan Lane's doing this, Faith Prince is doing that, I think I'll steal that, and all of a sudden, there's just moments of theirs flick up in your work, and in the next shows you do, and you sort of just, just pick up what you need in order to survive. How do you know, though, where to put this, that you'd steal a little of Nathan, and I assume Victor as well, as long as you're stealing. <laughs> how, how, do you, how are you able to... It's not even that. You, you, look at, you look and say what you're doing. I remember in, uh, oh. with uh, working in Guys and Dolls with Nathan and Faith, uh, because I was, not, I was a replacement, and I was not part of the rehearsal process. So I didn't really know what they were doing all the time, especially when I was off stage, and I'd sit in the wings, and, and I remember Faith had a... Had a had a relationship with the audience that was just like this, uh, that the rest of us sort of didn't have because we weren't allowed. She actually had the only soliloquy, and she had Adelaide's lament in, in, in the show. And, and I used to look out and watch her and say, why is she pulling them in? And I realized she, she'd give the audience a look and she kind of, like that, as, as though we were just, we're all best friends, aren't we? She, as, as though we're, you know, we're sitting there and individually having a moment with member of the audience, and I thought, isn't that interesting? Now, that's very interesting. She's able to do that because she has a soliloquy, and, and I don't think Nathan Detroit could do something like that uh, with the audience. Not quite as well, and, and to, to see her do that, and then to see Nathan play, you know. Very often, I would turn to the audience and say, I love you, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Work with me. <laughs> but it was, it's true uh, what uh, Murray was saying about experience, uh, that the audience is aware of the confidence of a performer mm. if he has gained that experience, and that he is a presence yes. who is not going to be shaken by any uh, accident that may take place. And that and makes them uh, all at ease. It makes yeah, them yeah, then the audience feels uh, confidence in the actor's mm. confidence, and then this bond is established between the audience. And, and the old-time performers, uh, the old Al Jolson kind of people who would milk the audience, who would manipulate the audience, uh, but they would come out on stage and instantly, the, the energy level would alter because of that. And this is something which is acquired, I assume, only by time. You wouldn't be that It is, you can manipulate it, but some people have it to begin with. And, and I, I'd like to mention something about this idea of stealing things. Uh, it's not a, a, all the time a conscious stealing, by the way. You can find yourself in the middle of a, of a line reading that you picked up and digested some time ago, and you realize that it's not yours. It's really the damnedest feeling. You'll, you'll be so proud of this particular thing that you've accomplished, and then you'll maybe see an old, old movie, and you'll hear exactly the line reading, and you'll go, Oh, God, I, I stole that. I, I hope nobody notices. You know, it's, <laughs> that happens with playwrights very often. <laughs> How do you have that communication with the audience, maybe? And with well, Victor? I, is your, <clears throat> so I, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, um, I, I guess I'm not as technical as a lot of the, what these other people are saying. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not as uh, conscious of it in that way. Um, I don't go out to get them, you know, I'm just, um, it's something else that happens and I, I don't know that I could say what it is. I know that I have a great time on stage with Victor Garber. I know that um, I, I really... Thanks, thanks <laughs> for saying that publicly, really. <laughs> <laughs> ADVT. <laughs> I don't know, you know, when... Can you feel an audience's reaction yes, to you? Yes, yes. Can, can, you, can you work with that to, and, and an audience that is cold and you feel that you're not getting through to them and it's a cold... Can you... What, yes, you I know suppose so, but I, can I, you do something? I don't know that I could explain what it is or how it is. I know that there are things to remember not to do. For instance, if an audience is cold and not laughing, don't, don't talk louder. Mm -hmm. Don't try to, you know, ram the jokes down their throats. Just, you know, be easy and gentle and hopefully they'll, they'll, come, they'll come to you. Sometimes they're, not, they're just not going to. Sometimes they don't like the piece. And there's nothing you can really do about that except just st keep your integrity as much as you can and just do the piece as much as well as you can and as much as you love it. Um, I don't. I don't really know quite how to say what it is because I don't. Um, 
I'm not well what versed in the that? technique. Well, I think, you know, oh, I can think I say one, one thing? Oh, yeah. Is that uh, when I'm in trouble on the stage, I try to, as my acting teacher um, taught, uh, is to really just plug into the other person and what's happening there. That's um, uh, play how the Meisner technique is what I studied, and, and that has to do with just listening, responding, and working off of the other person and, and, and paying attention to the relationship and the circumstances. I think that's really the most crucial part about, it, about any performance. And I think the one thing we're forgetting to mention is that it depends on the part you're playing. Mm. You know, you, there, are, there, are, there are, I mean, like, like you were saying, with Faith, I mean, she's, she's talking to the audience. My character in Damn Yankees, right off the bat, bat, comes out and talks to the audience, communicates to the audience. There's all, an immediate rapport, or a, hopefully an immediate, not always, believe me. <laughs> you were there last Wednesday. <laughs> 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 But you know, but the, the the point is that that if it's not you know if it's if it's not based in some sort of truth within you, it's bogus and it's not going to happen. It has to be somehow connected to who you are and what you're trying to do as a character. If, if you come out and wink at the audience or try to get their approval, it's the most nauseating kind of performance. Yeah. You know, Ever. it's yeah. just it makes me cringe when I see actors doing that, and it's it's not a good idea right. uh, from my perspective. You know, but if if it's you know, it has it's to part be part of the character. Absolutely, yeah. it's, you know, it depends right. on the character. And, and, and but Faith Prince is a magical performer. She can just course. walk on the stage even without but doing a soliloquy the, the reason and you talk to the, the audience, and they will. <gasps> because it's Who's based that? in truth. Yes. Because there's a connection to her, to her guts. Yes, but that yeah. comes from a long, long time of training. I happen or, and, and of, of experience. I happened to see an old seminar that Faith was on when she first started here. And she talked about doing an audition to go into a, a, a musical school in Ohio. And she had a cold or laryngitis, so they did a tape. And so from that came, that's years and years ago, or not really so many years ago, but enough for her to have gone from Ohio to New York to the, uh, I think she did the Fantastics, and then she did uh, one of the other shows downtown, and then off, off Broadway downtown, finally to Broadway. And in all of those tours that she did in the theater, New York came being able, when she had the right part, to, uh, to be able to be, communicate with the audience. But it was a long time process, and, and it's what you've all been talking about, that you get more from the experience of acting and working than you do, I'm sorry, Professor, than you do in the schoolroom. But you know, uh, Lily Tomlin told this story about she had met this woman <coughs> who uh, had worked at a, a Disney World type place where they had a some sort of a, a, a future world show they did where these sort of uh, robots came in, like animatronic type things, you know, where Lincoln comes out and talks to you. And, and these things came out every night, and obviously it was the same performance every single night. And she said, and she said the audience, each time they saw these robots, responded in a totally different way. They laughed in different places. And, and so there was, but this was sort of proof <laughs> that, that, you know, sometimes it, it just, people, the audience does affect the energy in the, in the theater and, and has a, does have an effect on your performance. But, you know, as, as Bibi was saying, it's really important to, for various reasons, for your, your ego, you want them to love you. You know, I'm, I'm a desperately neurotic person. I come out and, and if immediately I'm not uh, getting unconditional love. I, I, I start to, you know, get, no matter how long I've been doing this, I mm -hmm. still feel <laughs> I'm too old and tired. I don't know if I can get through this unless they love me. And, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes it's not about you at all. You know, it's, you, know it's, you can't let that get in the way and you have to get back to, to what's, the more you concentrate on what you're doing and what the other person is giving you in, in the scene, the better it is and, and the rest will take care of itself and, and sometimes an audience will sit there and not make a sound even in a, in a, in a, a comedy like, like laughter and then at the end of the play go crazy and you realize yeah. well, they, in their own way they were enjoying this. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't always make it as much fun but, but it's about concentrating on your work and not allowing the audience to make you. You have to be in control also and I think the more you're on stage the more experience you get um, 
as you were saying, the more experience you get, the, the more you can do that. And it comes to a point where eventually you can literally command the stage. And that's what... You know, but it's not just simply a question of going up and, 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 and doing a number, like for, for years. It doesn't, that's not enough. You, there has to be a classroom of some kind. I think it's lamentable, lamentable, that uh, older performers, people with many years' experience, have no masters to go to, to learn certain things from. Uh, the idea of throwing someone out on stage and saying, that, you know, throw them in the water and let them swim. There are other ways, and there are certain things you can cut through a whole bunch of of time and waste of time by, uh, with, a years it, with a year on stage, uh, with a year in class. There are certain things that are invaluable that you can learn only from other people who have been in the theater. And I wish more masters would be willing to share their experience with uh, with me. I would love to work with someone, and there's no one I trust except for Uda. Uda That's where, for, oh, I think regional theater comes in uh, for yeah. for. Uh, I, I mean, I think the English, w we bring over all these English actors and they're very skilled and good because they work all the time in this country. But they also work with each other. And they the work time. in the theater and they work in film yeah. and they work in television yes. and they, they work for no money in mm -hmm. regional theater. We, you know, I'm back in front of an audience for nine months now and I don't think I've ever been in a play that long. I've been in regional theater where we did many plays, but to do the same role for nine months is a very interesting experience and, and you're absolutely right. Each audience has, it's like another character in the play. Each audience has its own character and, and the danger... And Sister have you changed uh, your acting to the audiences through the nine months you've talked about? I don't think so. I hopefully have gotten, have improved. I mean, audiences <laughs> teach me so much. Yeah. Uh, but what, what about the, the danger with the is audition? to cater to an audience. The minute I try to cater to the audience, I'm gone. What do you mean by catering? Do by, by wanting them to love me. I'm not playing a, a sympathetic character to begin with, but if I want them to love me, they're going to hate me. There's just, it's just a simple rule. And if I try to just stay in the play, and I'm working with Tony Roberts now, who's wonderful, because every night something new happens and the audience does affect the play but we're not catering to them and uh, or we try not to it's a, it's an easy trap to fall in the other thing I'm I, I watch I try to watch is when I start thinking I'm good <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's such a trap, you know, when you think, boy, I'm really on to <laughs> And there's a smugness that, that you can pick up from it. I mean, I've seen it when I've been in the audience, and it's, it's a sort of smugness that, that comes across, and the audience gets it right, right away. So you have to find that kind of balance where you're out there and you're vulnerable, and, and yet you're also confident enough so that if you fall down, the audience isn't going to have panic that you're not going to be able to get up again. That's happened to me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Making a fabulous entrance with a parasol and a skirt and falling flat on my face. <laughs> and not being able to get up because I kept walking up my dress. <laughs> it was a nightmare. And the audience had a heart attack because I was young then and I didn't know how to how to handle it and make them feel comfortable. It was awful, but anyway. <laughs> what did you do, wave things. to them? I finally said there were all these wonderful, gorgeous men standing around in tights who were just looking. And I finally said, would somebody please help me get up? <laughs> <laughs> this was Shakespeare, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and they graciously did yeah. help me get up. <laughs> and then we went on with the show. Nathan, <laughs> you spoke of, of writing your own material as a stand-up comedian. And I was wondering, uh, do you, you continue writing? Are you interested in writing? Are you interested in being a playwright as well as an actor? Uh, I, I have to say, I, I'm sort of, no. <laughs> no, I haven't. I, I you know, I, I should. I wish I, wish I could, um, but uh, I haven't really pursued it. Um, you get no unconditional love as a writer, you know. No, that. it's, a, a, very it's lonely a lonely, business. lonely, yeah. lonely business, and certainly I have a lot of friends who are writers. Terence McNally, you know, is a great friend, and he, um, yeah, and I have tremendous respect for what it is that they do, and I, d I don't have that. I don't feel I have that discipline, at least at this point in my life, to sit down and and write the way when I did. It was at a time when I I had no other. I had no choice. I had to and. And uh, and I find that um, I sort of need a, a, a deadline or something. If I have to speak somewhere or do something, uh, I can I can force myself to sit down and do it. But um, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. But it's. Uh, Are there any other writers in the group here? 
I have a script that I that's in my closet when you speak of a lonely profession. <laughs> <laughs> it I've got sits one of those. there <laughs> <laughs> waiting. I would <laughs> ask how do you you're both working as cartoon characters in a sense. That's an entirely different kind of acting that takes place. How do you get through your personality? How do you get through acting with the costumes that you're wearing in, in the show, in Beauty and the Beast? And well, it's interesting. Um, in one interview, somebody asked me, so how did you prepare for this differently since you're basing your characterization on a cartoon? As if I'm going home every night and watching my video and go, okay, she winks here. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I, I didn't approach it any differently at all. And I think, um, I think what Victor said is the truth. You know, you can't always play reality because there aren't beasts locking girls up, but you can always well. play truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Good analogy, but yes. But I mean, in the sense of like the literal sense of what we're doing, there aren't teapots walking around. Mm -hmm. But what if there and that's were? That's perfectly yeah. normal well. to you. Right, but, English, but, English but English teapots. Drink. That's right, English teapots and candelabras and things. But, um, but you have to play truth, mm -hmm. even in that situation, and you can't Especially cater to the audience, and, and I think there are a lot of traps to fall into in, um, in our show in particular. Yeah, I think we fell into them all, uh, well, at <laughs> one point or another, and, and sort of worked and, our way and out. And you work your way out. Yeah, you I mean, find you can't wink to the audience. It doesn't work. Exactly. My problem was I was dealing with such a self-absorbed character <laughs> that uh, I you tended the trap there was to act in a bubble where you're just out there acting, not really caring what your partner's doing, and you have to keep on constantly remember, wait, you're, wait, you're wanting to get a reaction out of this person. And so, you know, get that reaction, have that feed, so you're, you're, you're back and forth listening. It's a little different for us because she really plays the, she's the eyes of the She's always straight. Uh, yeah. She, yeah, she's definitely the straight woman in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> for me, approaching this role, there were things that I wanted to do as far as movement, because uh, the uh, Disney characters and cartoons moved a little differently than, say, that we do. It's just a more dynamic uh, yeah. movement to it that I wanted to, dis to play what around with. What kind of direction with. were you given? Act well, good. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Score. You know, <laughs> don't mess up. Um, uh, Rob Roth, the director Rob Roth and I had dinner beforehand, and we were pretty much right on the uh, same thing. He basically just said, well, just go for it, pal. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so we did, and we, and we just see how far we could, we, we could uh, take this thing and uh, uh, made some rather bold choices and um, let, the, let the cards fly. But uh, the, the most difficult thing, uh, or the thing that I had constantly had to you know, shift my my focus to was the idea of, of getting a reaction. Because every time our scenes wouldn't work, and we have one particular scene that gave us a lot of trouble, uh, it was because we were not interacting. It had nothing to do with, oh, this step is wrong, or this step, why isn't this joke working? It had to do what my intention was. And uh, we'd, we'd shift that around. What does the audience uh, consist of? And how, do, how are they? Well, we have two different audiences. We it's have like the matinees, which, uh, which is a, a, a real circus sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and then we have our evening audiences. And, and they, What's they the difference go between the two? Um, there's chatter going on all through the matinees. <laughs> but it's not that they're not into it. It's because they're saying, oh, Mom, this song wasn't in the movie. And, and, <laughs> and you know, but who could ever learn to love a beast? And I'm revealed with a book, and 40 kids are going, Belle, it's Belle. <laughs> 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 And they're all staying awake and they're loving it. Um, but in the evenings, you know, there's definitely a sense of humor going on on stage that's for adults as well, especially the stuff I think between us. I mean, one night, one day on stage, I, I, I'm going out, I'm doing this Gaston song of mine, and, and I go up on this table and I sing, I'm roughly the size of a barge. This is during a matinee. And all I hear from the audience, I go, a barge, and I hear from the matinee, a barge! <laughs> <laughs> Some kid just stood up in the middle of the audience and just wanted to sing along. <laughs> well, what did you do? I got to a you? pal, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the evening performances, they, they tie in, I think, um, to the love relationship between Belle and the Beast, and they definitely tie into the more adult humor that we play. And the matinees, every time I'm at the foot of the stage, there's always somebody in the front row who tries to get my attention. <laughs> <laughs> Belle. 
Bell. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but tough. it breaks the monotony because it's two different shows. Mm -hmm. Tell but me about audiences in the other shows. What about you? Do you, what's the difference in audiences? We have uh, 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 you know, my, the great thing is when kids come to see Damn Yankees, and they and uh, and I encourage you to bring your kids to see Damn Yankees because it's it's a show you can bring your kids to, and uh, they sometimes we were talking about the other day. There's a little laugh, just a little kid's laugh, that just it just it, oh hello, um, <laughs> I don't get out much. It was uh, really uh, so charming, and and uh, I love. I mean, as as you were talking about earlier, I mean the most important thing is that people come to the theater. You know, however they come is, is, is however they come. But to, to, to see little kids and teenagers who have no idea what Damn Yankees is, you know, at, at backstage waiting for autographs at the stage door, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's thrilling to me. They're hooked when they do that. It's, and that's, that's important. It's all I'm there for. Sure. It's all I'm there for. That's yeah. wonderful. What about, uh, Ari, the, the fact that you are playing this absolutely loathsome uh, character, can you feel in the audience uh, the sense of their... Uh, to, this is a historic figure. This is a person that oh, people already have an opinion about. The thing that you've been talking about, the reaction, the responses from the audience mm -hmm. that are really that, that vivid are true of Roy because they hiss him. They actually hiss the villain. Some of the things that I say are so odious and they go, oh. <laughs> they go, yes. and then, so it's a success. Yeah. But I would like to ask, uh, add one thing about this, this idea of working when you're on stage and you get lost, working with your partner or, or, or locking into them. This does not always work because sometimes the partner is no good. <laughs> or sometimes uh, the partner is not looking at you or doesn't care about uh, you or, as you said, has a bubble or, <laughs> or deliberately avoids looking at you and, uh, and makes you uncomfortable. I think that the key really is here. This is where the work is and will always be. It's, it's got to be What do you your do in that situation with the partner? It's not technique. You've got you to you you make that person what you want you that act. person to be. You <laughs> act. You pretend like. It, it really is, it's that simple. It's very difficult when you're in a very important, serious scene, or in a comedy. One thing more, we talk uh, about all this experience we have and how we've learned and so on. It's also true, especially with comedy, that, uh, that you can f have a laugh, that it's a great laugh, and it, you, know, you can have it for four months, and baby, when it goes, you'll never find it again. So all this, the, these professionals, all this technique, it, you, it's, it's gone. It's ephemeral. It's, I was part of that in a Terrence McNally play called The Ritz, and we had a laugh that went on for about 10 seconds, I promise you. Jack Weston used to just count, eight, nine, <laughs> under his breath. Yeah. And one day, we lost it, and we never found it again. Hmm. So there's another element that we can't discuss. But there must be something that, that happened. There must be some part of you your delivery. You stop counting. Once you stop counting, it's all right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, when somebody tells you about a moment, it's the same kind of thing, I think. If somebody comes up and says, that moment <laughs> when you burst into tears that way and the tears come down halfway down your cheek, never again never. will that moment <laughs> ever happen. I don't know why that is, but it, it's probably the same thing as the laugh. Mm. Some, you become conscious of something or you try to control it or I don't know what. But the director and the author must danger, both blame the, the actors when that laugh goes. They must think you're well, doing it. Immediately, but besides, yeah. they're off somewhere else. They're, yeah. they're off. They're, I mean, yeah. they're in the South Seas. They're writing another play. Yeah. They don't care. <laughs> How do you, what do you bring to bear in that, in that terrible anger that you have? That you have to for be Roy hidden. Cohn? Yes, I, I relish it. I really enjoy it. <laughs> I, but you're not an angry I, I've discovered man. that no, I've discovered that that's the way to play it, because mm -hmm. he knows as a character, as a man, so well mm -hmm. what he inspires in other people that the more he makes them angry, the more excited and happy he gets. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. says things about Ethel Rosenberg that make my liver curl, mm -hmm. but it works. Mm -hmm. the, the nastier I get, the more the audience seems to love me. I can't understand That's it. Interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they know he's going to die, maybe, or I don't know. They, <laughs> do, do, they, do they love a bad man? Uh, what do yeah. you think? No, I think they take relish in seeing him uh, physically em em embodied by you on stage like that, and that they can ex exorcise as well as exercise an emotion otherwise right. not available to them. How, 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 how yeah. are we going to hate Roy Cohn, who's dead? You know, mm -hmm. but, but this way we can. Mephistopheles. And He's you might get slugged in the street someday. I don't know. No, they're afraid of me. <laughs> I'm afraid of you now. <laughs> <laughs> Scared. It is such. It really is such a powerful performance. And how do you manage it, matinee and acting? 
actually. Uh, right. No, 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 really. It's, 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 it uh, it's not. It's my work. I really mean it. Mm -hmm. I've done bigger parts. It, it, you, you do it. You get up there and you do it. Are you lost the in it? Yeah, obviously, are. though, I was surprised. I, I would have thought that you would be so lost in the part that nothing else would be going on around you, but the fact that you worried about your shoes I tell you, shows that there was another that. heart that was clicking on the back, and that's that's, that's early on. Now it's, it, now it's something else. Now I'm socks. I'm socks now. <laughs> 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 Nathan, what about the actual use of the voice? You have to sh uh, shout a lot uh, in, in, the, in your play. Now, is that wearing out your voice? Uh, it's it, sometimes. It's, it's very uh, tiring. Um, mm -hmm. I play a, a, um, a character named Max Prince, who was inspired by Sid Caesar. Um, uh, and, uh, and at the time, in the play, he... Um, he, he's an alcoholic, and he he takes tranquilizers, and and he's a pretty volatile man. And um, this is a comedy. And this is a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Nathan comes charging in like you know, roaring and ranting. And yeah. All it's a uh, yeah. Out. It's a it's a difficult thing because he's rarely in a quiet, contemplative mood. It's always um, he's in some sort of rage about uh, he's fighting the network and he's. Um, he's a very sort of tortured soul, and um, it was interesting when we started the play finding the right balance of of anger and because he had written him that he was written very angry and mm -hmm. and sort of he was kind of frightening and finding the right level of, of and also you know you can't if you can't start out there because where you have two and a half hours to go and uh, um, so I. You know, you start to define different ways of, of doing that, so you don't hurt yourself. Different mm -hmm. ways of, I mean, certainly, I, I always feel that um, uh, the great thing about a long run is um, is you you are able to explore that and and try every. I I played this part every way I can I can think of, and and hopefully I'll I'll find more ways. Is uh, that high pitch? Of, of excitement that that runs through the show is that hard to maintain? Is that built around you, or all of the characters? How well, essentially, I mean, I, I not since Tartuffe has there been like a setup for. Uh, they no. talk for thirty minutes about all of my problems and mm -hmm. what's going on, and then I have to come on and sort of live up to this. And and it, uh, well, it's not really until I come on that the play kind of we find out what the play is about. Is, is this man is he feels the network is undermining his show, and it's sort of his it's his waiting, battle. Not it's waiting for Gogo, -Go and then Gogo -Go actually shows up. <laughs> right. And now exactly. what do you do? Yeah, and it's um, a fantastic setup. Um, and it's and it's a very a very very funny play, but there's also a um, uh, I find it very um, at, the, at the end of the play I always feel that if if um, if the play is really working we can sort of turn on that dime and then and that they're moved by it's amazing I was thinking sort of you were so drained but yet you were kind enough to come talk to the students uh, the night that we brought them in from introduction to Berlin. You know what it's Wonderful. about? I, I, I hadn't seen, I worked, I did a play with George C. Scott uh, last year, a revival of a play called On Borrowed Time, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he came into the room and we were there to do an interview and we were talking and, and he looked at me and he said, um, do you, do you still love it? Do you still love acting? Mm -hmm. He said, that's what I remember when we first, I, my, I made my Broadway debut with him and when uh, he said, that's what I remember most about you is that how much you loved to I go out and act and, and I think, you know, that's, you have to sort of go back to that and say, mm -hmm. why did I do this? Oh yeah, it was because mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to get to the theater every night. And what did he say? Well, did you ask him, do you still love it? Uh, no, he scares the hell out of me. We're going to have to take a break, but before then, Gene, you did you worked in radio, didn't you? And you wrote for radio. Yes. Had, was it anything like this that was portrayed in uh, Laughter on the Twenty Third Floor when you were in it? No, <laughs> not at all. I thought not. <laughs> it was a more tranquil kind oh, of yes. time. Oh mm -hmm. yes, very but, qui very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to take a break now, and. Just stand up and stretch and walk around or do whatever you have to and then come right back again so we continue. I have lots more questions. You're not off the hook, any of you.
This is CUNY TV, Channel 75. I began to watch some of the programs. Excuse me. And to this day, I can't separate which was the radio hmm. and which the television because the pictures are so clear in my mind. Okay. No, I'm I just want to see uh, if anybody has any questions for the panel, you can come up and see me right here, and uh, we'll give you the paper to fill them out. Oh, yeah, that's, boy, that's a long way in everything, yes. from everywhere. Yeah. Uh, very rare. El Paso del Norte. Yes. Uh, no, not a bit. I just remember that. We're continuing the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre, and these are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. This seminar is on the performance, and a wonderful group of panelists are here to talk just about that, what it is to work in the theatre. And Brendan Gill and Jean Dalrymple are co-moderating this, and they are going to continue and as we discuss all the pitfalls and the pleasures of working in the theatre. Well, there's one thing that I'm interested in as an erstwhile reviewer and, and person who's been going to the theater for 60 or 70 years, like Jean. Uh, there are very few things that are absolutely new in theater, and certainly there are very few things that are or have been new that have been dangerous. But Marley and I were talking before this program about the fact that technology uh, is entering the theater in what may be a very dangerous way. Things in musicals, for example, so, so much of the lighting, the, the cues are all now programmed by a computer. There's no, there's no, there's not the margin of the performer's freedom to do uh, within a few seconds one way or the other. I remember at a musical recently, uh, the star singing uh, took maybe three or four seconds longer than she habitually took, and uh, the spot went off, and, and there she was uh, concluding her song in the dark. This would never have happened uh, a few years ago, and, and uh, I think Murray is very interesting uh, on this subject and, and, and his resentment, I uh, you would think you would have to call it, of the degree to which he is no longer that free person, the actor, dominating uh, the stage, uh, to taking his place fully on the stage. So Murray, would you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons that I am an actor is because of the, the primitive nature of it and the communication between me and the audience. I think it's, it goes back to cave times. I think it's, it is essentially that primitive. People come to a dark place, a great big <coughs> dark place, and they watch someone do something. Uh, when we start putting computers between the, the experience of the theater, my performing and their perceiving it, I think that we're uh, killing the absolute nature of the theater. It's uh, an odd thing. I think techno technology is entering our lives in a very negative way all the way around, in all aspects of our lives, but particularly in the theater. Um, it's an odd phenomenon that movie houses are becoming smaller, and uh, the theaters are becoming much, much larger, so that we need the aids of things like um, microphones and uh, special lights and uh, s things that, again, get between you and the experience of the theater with me. I think without that visceral exchange, we lose a very important aspect of our, of our lives, which is vanishing in many, many places. Uh, people who, uh, at the checkout counter, for example, in, in, in supermarkets, they no longer look at you and discuss things with you. It's really just zip, zip, bang, get out, you know. And, and the, the mail carrier, we used to have conversations with the mail carrier in my hometown. The garbage collectors were people we knew, believe it or not. All those personal contacts are gone. People are now retiring uh, into their, to their living rooms and staying there safely with their, their tapes. And they're not risking going out and seeing an experience. Maybe an accident. That's on stage, something uh, where someone goes up on lines. Now, if you go up on lines, you're, you're really in the toilet because the lights will go out on you and somebody else will start talking. Uh, part of the <laughs> excitement of the theater is the, not potential, that the potential, I don't know, seeing someone get out of a tight jam. That's part of the, the, the thrill. That's being taken away from us. What do you think I you think can do about do, it as an actor? Or I what don't do know. You you've got to start your own little theater, get a hundred seat house, get a little company of people. And come and back do down stuff. into the yes, small. Absolutely. Can I say, uh, we have, at Damn Yankees, we are blessed with real strings. 
We have a real string section. That's we right. have real violins. We have a real gorgeous harp in our orchestra pit. And there is, uh, I agree completely with what you're saying. And uh, I, um, I've done too many shows now where we've had synthesizers in the pit. In, um, you know, they sample in a guitar string and that does the introduction mm -hmm. to a, a song. And it's just, it, it, it sure does sound like a guitar and it sure does sound like a harp, but when you have those instruments there, it puts what you're saying, it puts the soul back into the music. You feel different, you sing differently, you dance differently, the audience gets to receive a different show and it's much fuller, mm -hmm. it's much more human, and, which is what the theater mm -hmm. is. It is a human experience. See, I think to, excuse me, uh, uh, I shouldn't be talking at all. I think that the reason <laughs> the dance has become so important in the last 30 years, 20 years, is because as everything else becomes dehumanized and, and, and in television and in movies and everything, plainly everything is blipped out, it doesn't work, you do it over and, and you have perfection. The one remaining place, depending upon the human body and yes. the opportunity not only to succeed splendidly, but the chance of failing, but, uh, is the dancer. But I have to say mm -hmm. that, I'm sorry, am I No, that's all. I, I have to say that something very, to me, very frightening is happening to dance, and that is uh, MTV and music videos and rock videos. And uh, I, it has done something because there have been maybe three people who knew, really knew how to film dance. And uh, I believe, unless there's somebody who's alive, these men are dead. Um, they've changed dance for cameras because they didn't know how to film dance, really. Bob Fosse knew how to film dance. Um, so now nobody knows how to do that. So they're changing. And now MTV, you know, music videos are very, very popular. And people watch that a lot. And they think they've they've done short clips and, and little isolated movements and that there. <laughs> and it's become something that I don't really know what that is. I'm not, I, 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 yes, they're dancing, but it's, it's a hybrid. It's not, it's not a pure dance form. It's, mm -hmm. it's something else. And, and I fear that that will educate an audience who unfortunately watch an enormous amount of <laughs> Um, you know, television. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I don't mean to bite the hand that fed me, but uh, I mean it in, in, in terms of music videos and, and things like this. It's, it's educating this large audience to say, well, that's what dance is. And then they go to a theater and they, and they see, they will well, see something like totally different. Mm -hmm. and, and my fear is that choreographers, and I have seen it happen, there, there, was a, there is a very popular musical on Broadway now that the choreography I find insulting as a dancer, as a trained dancer, um, because it's, it's bits. It's a bit here, it's a bit with a prop here, it's a bit with a prop there. It's not, it's no, it's, it's not that human thing that happens. A, a well-constructed musical, people will talk until the, it's, they just can't talk anymore, they have to sing. And then when they just can't sing anymore, they just have to dance. That's what dance is. That's what it should be. It is not a little, thing here and there and, mm -hmm. and get the camera right and an angle right there and it will evoke that's something else. Mm -hmm. Very good explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> Michael, uh, you want to go ahead. Victor. Go ahead. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, my son, my son is a drummer and he, was, he did an essay on, um, on drum machines and how perfect they are and how now they're, s they're not using them as much anymore because they're too perfect. It's exactly what you were saying. Mm -hmm. So that's my only hope. Right. I, I agree with you so completely, and it scares me. I used to think if, if there were such a thing as reincarnation, I'd like to come back, but I'm not sure I would now. <laughs> <laughs> I better get it together in this life, I yeah. guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, I have people who call up and they'll leave a message on, an, on my answering machine, or they might be crying or something, and they say, oh, I feel so much better now, and I think, you just talked to a machine. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. What's yeah. going on? Yeah. What did you want to take? The key? Well, I think it's, it's all it's all true and it's all happening. I think that the the the, um, the reality is that it's happening. So we have to then say, okay, what do we do about it, or how do we how do we go on? And I think that that we also have to remember that the experience that happens in a theater, for a young person, say, coming to the theater for the first time in a, in, a, in a musical or a play, um, will never be taken away. It can never it, it, the experience that that we all have had at some point 
will continue because there will always be plays and, there, the, and yes, there will be, the, the technology is here. I mean, it's not going anywhere. And, um, and as soon as it burns itself out or destroys itself, it will, it will, it will always go back to the experience of an actor and an audience and a, and a, mm -hmm. and a musician and an audience. And it's, hap it's still happening. I mean, you know, Laughter on the 23rd Floor is a play. It's written by a playwright. There are actors. They make you laugh, they make you cry. It's still happening. And as long as that continues to happen, there's always hope. And I think that Angels in America is, is, is a play. It's a new play. It's, yes, there's technology involved. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, when I go see that play, I have the experience of a, of a, of a play. Mm -hmm. And um, so as much as we can bemoan what's happening, and I mean, I mean here are two actors in a, in a very successful musical that is based on a cartoon. Uh, there's room for all of it. And I think that's what we have to remember. There has to be room for all of it. And the audiences will find their way or not. Uh, and, and we as actors have to, have to go, you know, do what we do with, with integrity and, and ethics and, and continue to, to fulfill our functions as actors, as dancers, as singers. And, and it will always, you know, it, the, but the, uh, my complaint is that there has to be room for all of it. That, that you have, as an audience member, you, the menu has to be wide enough that you can go and see Beauty and the Beast and you can go and see Passion in the same, you know, in the same week. And that's always been my concern, is that, is that because it, it's going to be there, uh, so, so we just have to continue. We have to accept it, we have to embrace it, and we have to move on. Well, it's almost like you know, from going from footlights to spotlight, and they said you have to learn what, how to work with it. Yes. But how do you have all of that continue for us? The small play mm. as against the great big. Yeah, that's the question. Well, you know, Arthur Miller's play that. just opened. I mean, <laughs> Terrence McNally's play. I mean, will be done at Manhattan Theater Club. There will always be theaters who will do plays. There will always be actors who will do who will act in plays. Um, and yes, you've of just course. mentioned two heavyweight playwrights. Uh, that's, yeah. that's not a that's not a, a difficult trick to produce those people. It how sure the, is. How about the well? It, it is, sure it's is. tough for them. And <coughs> what about the new playwrights? Well, of yeah, course it's tough. Of course we're it's tough. About. But I mean, that's and, you know, where, where's the training for these people going to come from if we're going to continue to do a technological progress? My belief is that if the play is good, it will be produced somewhere. It may not be produced on Broadway. It may not be produced off Broadway. Somewhere the play will be done. Somewhere. You know, well, if it's not the old the, globe, if it, you know, the, the, the yeah, danger is that there's is that people start to think, well, the only kind of theatric, the only reason, the, the only theatrical experience uh, they're getting is, and because of the ticket prices, that they feel you, well, you better dazzle me with something, right, and then, right. and then that is Cuts. becomes known as the theatrical quote, experience, quote, quote, quote. whereas you know, uh, it gets harder and harder for a serious play or a, pl a play that that may not, uh, without, without a lot of hype and without, a, that may just be um, a play that's good, well, a well-made play to be done. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, the, a theatrical experience to me was, was like in Angels in America, seeing, seeing uh, Marsha Gay Harden sit there and talk about, uh, and give that speech about uh, the end, sort of at the end of the play. And, um, and that's sort of magical when those things happen. And, and I mean, to me, that's, Hopefully, what it's what about. What do you think can be done about ticket prices? Anything, <laughs> like in technology, you'll not go back. It won't go away. It'll, it's here, and the ticket prices are here. Do you think there is anything that you can do, anything that that you in any way that you can influence the cost of tickets? Can you get more student tickets? Can you get more last minute? Tickets at the box office, not depend on TDF. Can you can you organize anything more as an actor? It's That's what form. worries the, the theater prices are what worry me because it it has become for the elite in Europe. Everybody goes to the theater. Everybody goes to it's opera. made available. Everybody goes to, to concerts. Prices are country, almost as high, it? but there are more. The prices there are more areas that you can get lower ticket prices right at the box office, not mm -hmm. having to go to you know a, a TDF, which is wonderful, but. If you're not going to do that, you can go to a box office. If you're there at 7 o'clock at night and they'll know that there are X number of seats that they make available to you. I don't think the producers are doing that here. I don't know that they are. Maybe a few of them are. I know that Cameron McIntosh does it. I don't know if any of the others are doing it. You can it. see my show for $10 on a Wednesday. All right, how? Really? Can't beat that. Really yeah, well, how do you do that? Wait you got to go to the box office the day of the performance, and you can see it for ten dollars. How many um, tickets? And in the evening, you can see it for twenty bucks. But you've got to oh, be there early. How, mean, how do we let people know show. about we, that? We have twenty dollars tickets, and I think they're fifteen on Wednesday night. No, at at yours as well. At yours so as well. What possible. about you? So 
I used to see. You have to pay full price to see our show. You're going to have to go to questions. Our salaries are so damn high. Yeah. But it's worth it, okay? Now leave me alone. I don't know about this. Future producer over here. I don't know. I didn't know that that was. Well, let's let's brood it about. It's available. Why shouldn't it be? See it. We have a lot of questions now. Would you start with questions? Okay. Yes, I'd like to ask you the difference when you are creating a role in an original play, and the difference between when you're stepping in and redoing a role in an established play. Because I know there's a big difference as far as writing goes. I'll, make it, I'll, make, I I'll say very quickly, uh, I, I've just stepped into a thing. For one thing, you, you know it works. So that takes a lot of pressure off of you. And when, you, when you're originating a part, when you're creating one, it's up for grabs, baby. It's like, uh, let's try this and see if it works. Uh, fitting yourself into somebody else's performance and trying to get on this train, as I've described before, that is already running. You just have to jump on the train and, and fit yourself in. After a little bit of playing with it, uh, say uh, maybe uh, five or six weeks, you will make the part your own. You've got to just dump your ego at the doorstep for a little while while you fit into the play. That's all. It's not a big deal. I think that there's no question that creating the part is much more fun. The danger of it is exciting. All those jokes that you're telling that you're not too sure are really going to work. <laughs> it's very exciting, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the great thing about uh, with this play, we went out of town and and uh, did it for three weeks in North Carolina. So, and, and Neil Simon was there every day and rewriting, and it was, it was sort of old time theater being out of town and, and changing every day. And, and, uh, yeah, and I've gone into a play, I went into Some Americans Abroad, <coughs> and when it moved, <coughs> excuse me, to the Vivian Beaumont. And, but I had sort of an advantage. I had seen the play, but I knew so many of the people involved in the show that it just felt very comfortable. Um, uh, so, uh, I was very fortunate that way, but it, I'm sure it's it's uh, slightly terrifying. And, and uh, um, but yes, you do have the advantage of knowing of knowing that it's uh, that the show itself works, and somehow you have to just fit into that. It's completely right. terrifying. <laughs> I had to go on with this guy with two guys, two hours rehearsal with him, and then you're on. Yeah. But that's sort of fun too. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the excitement of it too. Is not. It's uh, having someone new there and not knowing what's going to happen. And they say the, excuse me, they say the adrenaline that's pumping through an actor's body on opening night is equivalent to the adrenaline of a fighter pilot in battle. <laughs> and I believe it. So Which so when we die, we don't get tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> I'm exhausted right now. Um, <laughs> Z.D. Neuwirth uh, alluded to it before when you mentioned uh, that you didn't want to bite the hand that feeds you, yes. referring to television. Yes. I was wondering if, if you, if, if any of you feel larger or smaller in respect of the fact that you're now not on TV and not in the films, but on Broadway, and particularly in regard to how you're recognized in the street and how the media treats you, because I think there's a difference in the way you are treated, even though you were the same persons. It's a lot of questions. What is the question? <laughs> <laughs> if you feel yourself larger or smaller or different than you were when you were on TV or on films when you well, were do, on Broadway. Well, does that mean, do you prefer what you're doing? Do you no, not that. that. If, if you sense yourself differently treated by, right. by mm -hmm. yourself and by the world around you. There seems you. to be more respect for the theater in general from the public and from critics, I guess. Uh, if that's what your question is, from the outside world, there seems to be more respect for yeah, theater than there is in general for television. Except in Los Angeles. Yeah. Except in <laughs> Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, uh, the theater f on the entertainment food chain falls somewhere between folk dancing and accordion playing. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they feel you're out of work. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Looking for work, yeah. My, my question is directed toward B.B. Newworth. Having performed with Bob Fosse in Sweet Charity, the revival, and also with Gwen Verdon, do you find that Bob's influence, even though he's not with us now, do you find that he influences your performance? I hear his voice every day. Uh -huh. I hear his voice in my ear every day. And if... Uh, if I, I, I if I'm not uh, I try to listen for him and I keep his words and his daily and Gwen the same thing. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you.
My question is directed to the panel as a whole. I think we had a consensus earlier that uh, actually performing is the best way to get your training, is the best way to learn acting. Uh, my question is how do you get from the teacher studio where maybe you've got to start into that apprenticeship role, make that jump from student to working actor? C could I answer that question simply because it gives me an opportunity to mention the American Conservatory Theater where I spent several years, which is a theater that Bill Ball founded. And what was so it's back to what Murray was saying earlier. We were performing plays. We, in fact, one season we did 30 plays in a season. We had, we had two theaters. And there were two companies. And what we did was we, we took classes, we taught classes, and we performed. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary. It's the most creative period of my life. So there we were, professional actors on stage, working with students who got to work with us on stage. We taught the students. We also took classes. Perfect and we were performing and rehearsing at the same Perfect. time. It was absolutely a gift. And, and that building at 450 Geary Street, if you walked past it, it, it bulged. You know, you could hear Shakespeare in one room and tap dancing in another and somebody me it's trying the to sing. It's the beginning of the American <laughs> Theatre Wing School. I'm sorry? Uh, the American Theatre Wing School started that way for returning veterans. It's wonderful. Who were able to retool their trade. And they had wonderful people there that taught them and they could go from one room to another. And then they in turn took what they were working on out to a hospital or to a high school in order to have an audience. And that was the whole beginning of these seminars, as a matter of fact, because I found that when the school closed, there was no other way of the sharing of experiences and, and, and learning at the same time from each other as well as giving back. I think for young actors now it's really hard and I think it's, it's always been hard to be an actor or to be in this, in this business, but I think that there is no way. There's no one way. Your way is the way. So, so you have to find your way into this business somehow. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, uh, you know, and I think it's just, it's, it's uh, auditioning and, uh, you know, and going wherever it is you can to act. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's, you have to sort of follow that within yourself and don't listen to anybody else. You mentioned the word audition. Can I just intercept right now and get a quick round the panel on auditioning? Did you audition and how do you feel about auditioning? Do you want to start being You've opened a can of worms as well. <laughs> I like to audition. Um, uh, Sometimes you, you'll see a role and uh, you'll know of a choreographer and you get in there and you actually do their choreography and it doesn't feel so good on your body. And then you'll know that maybe that's not the place for you. Mm -hmm. um, or you'll, you'll get in and actually be working on a script and say it reads well, but now that I'm actually doing it, you know what, it's just not right. Gives you a, a better chance to really examine the material regardless of if it's um, song, uh, words, or, or dance. And uh, I like it. Can you go around? Uh, auditioning, uh, I'm sort of a love-hate thing with it. Uh, sometimes it's great, depending on who you audition for. And, and sometimes it's just, uh, they just don't look up from their papers. And, and because you're, you, you basically have like 30 seconds, you walk in the room. And then you go back again. Oh, yes, that's And then you go back, yeah, I mean, you're just basically just going up. Because they've got something in their mind. And, and, and the way the market is these days, they can kind of get it. You know, and the, you cannot, as long as, personally, as long as I do a good job, I feel great. So when I do a bad job, I'm just awful. Can I just, can I just, because you just reminded me, the worst part about auditioning is a lot of times the people you're auditioning for, there's a lot of disrespect and um, for the performer, for mm -hmm. the artist, and so that reminded me of that. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, do you, do you teach auditioning in your class at all? I teach everything. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> How do you feel about auditioning? And auditioning, I hate it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a necessary thing, and sometimes it, it's, as, as Burke says, it's a, the, the, you know, the, the potential for humiliation is always there, <laughs> and um, I've often greeted it. Um, <laughs> So I, I just keep going, you know, I just keep going. And that, so you have to learn to do that and go over it and go back again. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure if I had to, had, had to audition for Damien Yankees, I probably wouldn't have gotten the part, you know. <laughs> so I was very fortunate that Jack O'Brien knew me and knew my work, you know, but, but that's not always the case. And, and, you know, I'll just keep going. Nathan? Um, yeah, I agree with what everyone has said. I, I think it's, it's, yes, it's a necessary part of of the business, and but not an always pleasant one. It's a, it's a matter of you know how you look at it and try to make it the most positive um, 
I can remember auditioning. It's probably why I have no film career. I auditioned for a movie <laughs> called Rat Boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I went in and I... And I was someone who was holding Rat Boy hostage. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had these lines and I had to, you know, look into the camera and say, Listen, lady, if you ever want to see Rat Boy again. <laughs> I think so, we have time. And, uh, uh, so I and you didn't get I, the part? I, 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 I did it just like that, too. I, I started, I said, if you ever want to see Rat Boy again. I'm sorry, let me start again. Listen, lady, if you ever want to see Rat Boy <laughs> And I finally an, said, an, I have to leave right now. now. <laughs> I have to lie down. And she, she said, the person said, do you know who's directing this movie? I said, who? She said, Sandra Locke. <laughs> Clint Eastwood's girlfriend. I said, well, not since Orson Welles has there been such a visionary. Yes. <laughs> what was I thinking? If you ever want to see Rat Boy, let me out of here! <laughs> <laughs> we have time for just one more question. What yes, my question is for Murray. Um, I know you have a very busy schedule with movies and theater. How do you coordinate that to come and teach us? And I can vouch for him, he does teach everything. It's one of my students. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, you have to get someone who's very reliable to come and uh, stand in for you when you have um, a rehearsal, which I have, by the way, class coming up this Thursday. <laughs> for our show, brush up. Uh, but, but you have to rely on your students to come up with the goods. Uh, I have private sessions with them whenever I try to make up for the classes that we miss. I depend a lot on the uh, kindness of my students and uh, their hard work. I'd like to mention one thing briefly about the audition process. It's the same thing, I think, essentially as the acting process. It's bigger and it's bolder, but essentially what it means, it, it counts on you using whatever it is you have to offer because there's only one thing that will ever sell you and that's the thing that makes you so completely individual apart from everyone else that's the thing that these people want to see they want you to tell them the answer because they don't know the answer and if you go in and try to find that thing in yourself yourself alone that you have to offer you'll come out of the audition if you don't get it it doesn't matter you have really done the right thing thank you very much I This has been an extraordinary panel, and uh, I, we have to bring it to a close, as we always do, and, and I think that we could go on and on and on, and then we still wouldn't get all the questions and the answers that uh, we can get from this panel. The American Theatre Wing is proud to present the people that we do to talk about working in the theatre. This is just one of the seminars that are being given, the one on the, on the performance and one on the play script director, one on regional theater, and one on the production. This seminar is coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and I am delighted to be able to be here. I'm delighted to be head of an organization like the American Theater Wing that works year-round to say theater, theater to students and to the audience. Everybody come to the theater. There's nothing like it. Thank you very much for being here.